All right. Hey, folks. My name is Leah Cruzen. Um, I'm a clinical professional in our Wilmington office. I'm happy to be here with you guys tonight and um, talk about this very important topic. And I'm glad to be joined here by these lovely uh, resource specialists this evening. So I'll, I'll let Wanda take the opportunity to introduce herself as well. And Jelana. Sure. Hi, everyone. Wanda Curley. And I'm one of the autism resource specialists serving out of the triad area. I'm glad to be here with you all this evening. I'm also the parent of a 29 year old adult on the spectrum. Thanks for joining us. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to be before you. My name is Jolana Kinlaw. I'm an autism resource specialist out of the Eastern area and I'm out of the Greenville office. I am as well a parent of a child on the spectrum who is eight years old. Um, also, my background is in mental health. I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor um, with a specialty in substance abuse. Awesome. Well, um, I'm happy to get these ladies here with me. Um, Jolana will be paneling today, um, and then I guess tonight, it's no longer the day. <laughs> and <laughs> Wanda will be doing the second part of this presentation, which is going to be on end of life planning. Um, I'll be presenting on the first part of this topic, which is on managing loss, um, how to support your loved one through grief and to help understand death and dying um, and all the cycles that we go through in life. Uh, so before we get started, I did want to just take a moment to acknowledge uh, the easy one to talk about. Um, but I think the more practice and the more prepared we can be for these events, um, the better we can support our loved ones who will also be going through some of these things simultaneously so simultaneously with us at times um, so that you know they can be as prepared as possible. And so that um, if you're also encountering a loss and um, you know, suffering through that grief, you're, you've already done a lot of education and support surrounding these topics. Um, and you won't have to, you know, scramble and search for the right resources. So um, our objectives for tonight uh, will be to get our PowerPoint going. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> our objectives for the night uh, will be to determine strategies for explaining death and loss to your loved one, uh, to understand the common reactions to loss and learn how to identify issues with effective coping, to learn about the ways to help your loved one cope with loss. And then Wanda will be touching on uh, how to discuss the importance of planning ahead for your loved one's future. And she'll give you some general information and resources on basic tools to consider for end of life planning. So in an ideal world, um, we're setting a foundation first so that we can um, begin helping our learners to understand about death by educating before a loss. And it's not as easy as it sounds, of course, that makes it sound super simple. Um, but when we're thinking about teaching on these things, there are a couple recommendations um, that are autism specific. Um, I think with with this conversation, it's important for us to be as concrete and honest as possible. Um, we wanna be very straightforward and describe exactly what happens to our bodies and what that means. Um, we wanna use concrete information about what the meaning of death is. So when we die, our bodies no longer bring in air. That air no longer gives um, oxygen to our blood, you know? Um, dogs who, are, who have passed away don't bark anymore, trees, or flowers that are dead might not bloom any longer. Um, and so throughout this conversation, I, I, it's, it's interesting to use this kind of language because we often use euphemisms, um, but just in order to begin practicing the, the way of talking about these things, um, throughout this presentation, you'll notice that I won't really use terms such as passing away. I, I might use the term death and that can be a little striking at times, but. I think it's because the education I have around this is sort of, uh, and the help I've done with this has been for folks with autism. So it's, it's already in here. Um, so uh, just wanted to prepare you for that one and two, just go ahead and set that, that, that excuse me, that foundation. Um, so I mentioned before, we do wanna avoid euphemisms. Um, so using terms like going to sleep, passing away, um, that can be a little confusing, right? So 
if I go to sleep, will I not wake up? Like, or will I be gone or will I have to go, you know, to the graveyard um, or passing away? Um, it, it can be a really um, difficult thing for folks to understand. Um, so we'll, we'll continue using that concrete language um, and teaching about these things. Uh, in addition to those considerations, it's important that when we're teaching about death, uh, we take things slowly at the pace of our learner um, and at the level that is appropriate for our learner. So that might, for uh, your loved one, mean lots of visual supports, lots of slow bits of information, really, really concrete examples, um, you know, like this is a plant that's alive, this is a plant that has passed away. Um, the other thing we want to consider is um, helping somebody to understand these big concepts can take some time. Um, and that is, you know, before or after any event that, you know, uh, contributes to loss. So um, it's pretty normal during this process of learning about death to have lots of questions. It's also very normal um, for people to be silent and to, to kind of process it slowly over time. Um, when, you know, talking about supports to aid in this conversation, um, every learner has their, their strengths, but um, using what you find to be most effective, uh, whether it be, you know, videos like The Lion King, you know, where Mufasa, dad passes away, you know, if that's interesting, or um, some of the other examples I gave before about, you know, using nature as a guide. Um, there are lots of different um, Pixar films and Disney films, they like love to talk about it for some reason, but it gives us good material. Um, looking for those tools too that also model um, forward thinking in them as well, uh, where the character then um, doesn't stay stuck. Uh, looking for tools that really iterate that, I would emphasize as well. So um, when we're teaching about death, we want to teach about all parts of the life cycle. We don't want to overemphasize death because that just feels very scary, right? We're all born. So what does it mean to be alive? You know, it's very important to have that part of the conversation as well. What is living? Um, it means I'm breathing. It means I'm eating. It means I'm playing with my friends that I experience happiness and sadness. Um, and so we don't want to overemphasize a topic, especially if you have a sensitive learner who tends to overempathize. Uh, it can be a big, scary, big, scary conversation to have. Um, and I realized too that, you know, this is, sounds like a very complex set of, you know, set of skills. Um, and I think e each of these things can sort of be incrementalized uh, to cater to a learner of every level. Um, and it might just be the nuts and bolts and we experience happiness, we are alive, that's great to be. Um, and it, it could be more complex of like, what is true happiness, you know, depending on um, how, how your learner likes to express these emotions and feelings and have these conversations. So, um, you can help guide in that, you know, at a level that's appropriate. I'm sorry, my dog has found something to bark at. <laughs> um, so if, you know, this, you know, these considerations in mind, if anxiety is beginning to peak, you want to step back, um, provide processing time, especially if you're, you're teaching before there's been, you know, any loss or anything like that. And even after, you know, if you are afterward, same goes. If there's anxiety, step back, provide reassurance, provide processing time. Uh, whenever we're talking about these things, um, you know, there are causes of death. And so that itself lends into this conversation of when we die, what are the things that we die from? And are all things that, you know, if we become ill, does that mean we die each time? No, that there's a big difference between a stomach ache um, and a terminal condition. So you want to be very clear about examples and non-examples of each of these different things that, um, you know, could contribute to somebody's wellness. And so I, you know, in thinking about these things, this would be for a more complex learner, perhaps, um, describing different injuries, you know, different kinds of diseases, um, different accidents, you know, uh, what's a big accident versus a small accident, 
Um, stubbing, you know, your toe versus being in a car crash can be quite serious, but we don't want to scare our learner learners by overemphasizing the bigger events and underemphasizing the small day to day things because we might accidentally create some anxiety around any accident at all. So fair representation for all things big and small um, would be my recommendation here. Um, I gave just an example here of you know, how you might talk about illness, for example. So our bodies attack illness and injury using our immune system. Um, sometimes doctors can cure us. Um, sometimes our bodies need to heal. Sometimes the uh, illness isn't curable, but doctors will always try their hardest. So you know, just using that same, um, same theme of concrete language throughout uh, will aid in these conversations. And if uh, there's curiosity on a certain topic, then you can lean into that and, you know, assure the person um, where needed and reiterate. Okay. So uh, the other part of this as well is we want to teach about what is health and what is lifespan. Um, of course, we know that <laughs> we all have our time that comes to an end. Um, and explaining the lifespan can, you know, really provide some assurance in a way of like, if I, I take care of my body and I'm well, most of the time I will be a-okay. I have nothing to worry about. Um, and, you know, I, for some learners, uh, especially some of my really concrete fellas um, and gals, <laughs> although I'm thinking of somebody specific in mind, you know, there, there is some anxiety around his grandfather aging, for example. And so breaking it down of saying, you know, actually, you know what, I think grandpa goes for a walk and grandpa takes good care of his health. And, you know, are, are, are there signs we should worry? Okay, let's see. You know, are they strong? Yes. Healthy? Yes. Older? Yeah, but that's okay. So it might lend into some of those conversations and it might, you know, um, help you in that a little bit as well. Um, so those are just a couple of general, um, general recommendations when teaching about um, death lifespan and, um, and health. When it comes to explaining illness of a loved one, uh, of course, you as the parent and, or caregiver will want to determine what level of detail is appropriate. Um, like I mentioned before, we have some overemphasizers in the house, you know, where this is is information overload and it like breaks my heart in half and then some. Um, and then I also, you know, I know there are learners out there who find lots of peace and in information. Um, and so for you as the parent or caregiver, I, it's going to be on you to moderate because you know them best, but it's going to be, you know, important to generally describe what's happening, um, explaining why they're in the hospital, um, if there's any changes or any ex anticipated changes too, that might be important um, to describe, you know, especially um, if that might be disturbing to the individual for them to see those changes without explanation. Uh, so uh, along with that, you may then discuss the progression of illness um, and how that might affect your individual that you're taking care of. So you know, Grammy might not be able to come to our Christmas tree lighting festival. I know that's in two weeks. It's very important to you. How about we take a tree there instead, or, you know, kind of provide that alternative, but we have a very clear picture of how that impacts things around them as well, so that um, it's not so abstract. Um, it can, you know, be helpful. Um, any changes in routine, of course, um, if that person's involved in their care or is a big part in their life, um, you know, if, if, if it's possible to create other routines where they're able to pop in um, and have an alternative time, whether it be, a, a, you know, a visit um, somewhere neutral if, if the hospital is a sensitive place or if, you know, a hospital visit, it wouldn't be um, too disturbing, um, then potentially looking into that option. But being very clear, um, and saying, this is what the hospital might look like when we get there. Can I show you a picture of what a waiting room looks like? Can I show you a picture of some equipment you might see when we're walking down the hall? These are the things that might be, um, you know, in grandma's room with her and she might look a little different or 
she may have some special equipment that's helping her to become well again, um, attached to her body in places. So as you know, as you're thinking about things, um, just keeping those things in mind of what to describe and what you think uh, your loved one might be able to um, to witness. And so following a loss, uh, we're going to take into consideration all that we just talked about, right? The same principles apply. We want to talk very concretely about things. We want to avoid the euphemisms and we want to go at the pace of our loved one. Oh, there we are. Ah, okay. So we do have a specific question about um, a nonverbal individual um, losing his dad. So um, I'm going to go over, and this may be helpful, a couple of visuals and social narratives, some really concrete ways to teach effective coping skills. And hopefully that will begin to um, answer this question a bit more. Um, I know that the information I'm giving here may seem overwhelming for a parent that has a learner at home who may be more impacted by intellectual disability as well as autism, or maybe um, in a, a profile where um, you're not quite sure what skill set they do have from a language standpoint of understanding. Um, and so there's you know, a variety of tools that we'll discuss coming up here that I'm hoping will cater to um, folks who are able to have lots of complex conversations about this, but also our learners who may not be able to communicate vocally with us um, and explain the very basics and engage in some calming sort of routines that remind us of those who will be lost um, so that we can begin to simulate some of those um, good feelings associated with the memories of the ones that we love. So after breaking the initial news um, of a loss, we want to be sure that we provide assurance to the loved ones that we're, you know, that we are helping. Um, we want to make sure that um, they know that they are loved, they have people to take care of them, they need to know exactly who those people are, and they need to be in assurance that they are not in danger as well. Um, we also want to normalize all emotions. And um, just kind of remembering that ex emotional expression and feeling emotions are very different things, right? So our learner might not be expressing uh, a, you know, the, what you would expect kind of emotion here, um, but that doesn't mean they're not feeling very sad and understanding that that loss is meaningful. Um, in some situations, you might even see the opposite emotion um, demonstrated than what you might expect, right? Like you walk into a room full of sad people and you don't know what to do there, so you, you have a nervous laugh. I mean, that for some people is like, oh my gosh, what are they doing? But in that situation, we just have to sit back and say, wow, this is overwhelming. I don't, I'm not sure how to feel either. And just provide that assurance, like it's okay to feel however you're feeling. It's okay to feel it out loud. It's okay to feel it inside. You know, it's okay to feel it now and it's okay to feel it later. Um, so just uh, taking that, that role of reassurance. Um, we also want to model forward thinking. Um, it's it's hard. I, I'm not talking, you know, we don't want to be positive, 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 where it is also, it's a sad time. You know, we don't, um, that's not what I'm trying to say here. But I do, what I do want to say is for um, us to, you know, be effective at modeling how to move on from loss, it's good to point to the next thing that we can be looking forward to. So it might just be, hey, I know today is really tough, but I'm really looking forward to going on a walk with you later. Or I know that right now I'm busy in my office. I've got to figure this stuff out, but me and you, we're going to have that special time. Um, and keep, you know, keeping those other scheduled things as consistent as possible as well um, so that there's not total, total disruption. Um, and I know that especially with an intimate loss for somebody who is in the immediate family, that might not be as easy or as possible, um, but keeping those, those critical things um, the same. So I'm talking about um, death. We, you know, I kind of touched on this before, but all folks on the spectrum are going to be experiencing emotions uniquely. Um, 
So it might be that they're not, uh, you know, expressing their grief in the way you might expect. Um, and it, you know, it, it could vary. Um, so just the big thing, the big take home here is to carefully listen, carefully observe and see what is changing, um, what's staying the same, how can I support them, um, you know, and then give sensitive and non-judgmental responses. So yes, that is really tough or, you know, um, or it, it might be, you know, I, I mentioned like there's this incongruent sense of um, things before, but there, there might be, um, emotions that are congruent with the situation, but that are, are really big emotions, big, big sad, and also providing space for the big sad, um, making sure that the environment um, is conducive to calm um, in the best way that you can design it to be. Um, so I, I think a, a big point of um, observation comes in when we're talking about um, these things and, and you know emotional expression um and so mourning is going to look quite different right there are quite a few things that we can certainly monitor for we can monitor for the person's emotional state we can monitor for their cognitive ability and what they we know their their habits to be um, along with their behavioral health and their physical health um and some you know i i don't want to skip over this part because i do think it is important to iterate um some, once, once the initial loss has been sort of processed, you may then see recurrence of um, some mourning and grief-like behaviors um, at the anniversaries like uh, of the death or you know, other times when the individual might've been looking forward to spending time with this special person. Um, I know for me, I think about my mom when it's her birthday every year. Um, and so it's, and you might be more likely to see these things come about because all these signs are there that, oh, this is my time to have this special time with this person. Um, but then there's a letdown. And so just anticipating and trying to um, create remembering routines during those, those months so that you are giving a way to cope effectively. Um, and we'll talk more about those in just a moment here. Um, let's circle back to talking about the things that we can monitor for effect to determine whether or not um, our loved one is coping effectively. Um, and I, I hate to do this in list form, but it's, it's the easiest way to do it. So, um, you know, I, if anyone wants these written out there, I have this blog post that goes with this too. That way you can like really read through and process like where are they on the scale of where they were with us versus where they used to be. But um, just for the sake of those present tonight, I will go through these. Um, so, and yeah, I'll go ahead with the emotional expressions. I mean, this is gonna vary of course, but you may see increased anger um, or the person becoming aggressive or combative, um, maybe becoming more demanding or attempting to exert more control of the environment, right? That makes sense. Um, given that there's been something really unpredictable that's happened. Um, the person might seem anxious, uh, may have increased crying or may become tearful more often with no clear antecedent. Uh, they may engage in withdrawal or unresponsiveness, un unresponsiveness, or they may appear unconcerned or totally in control. So there's really this wide spectrum of emotions here that can happen. Um, any, there are some cognitive effects as well. So the person might have a harder time with processing information they might feel more confused than usual. They may be less likely to be able to articulate their feelings or ask questions, have a harder time with managing or organizing their schedule or remembering responsibilities. They might be preoccupied with topics such as death or the person who was lost. Um, they may ask questions more frequently than usual or need assurance more frequently or may become preoccupied with the permanency of other familiar people in their lives. Some potential behavioral changes um, to watch for acting out physically, you know, such as throwing things or destroying property, attempting to hurt themselves or others, showing an increase in repetitive or self-stimulatory behaviors, becoming more irritable, seeking solitude more often, or experiencing a regression or loss of skill. And then some physical responses to watch for, um, having a change in appetite, 
toileting, sleeping patterns, having uh, increased fatigue or sensory sensitivities, um, experiencing increased body aches or headaches, or having a harder time with grooming and other hygiene routines. So, you know, any change in these that um, comes might not indicate a large issue, right? Um, some of this is to be expected with stress. But when you're seeing multiple factors that are playing into, um, into one another, um, or if you're seeing really big striking changes um, and you're not sure how to support your loved one, I would recommend kind of following, um, following along with a three-month rule of if, you know, if things are going on for longer than three months, um, especially physical responses, appetite, toilet, and sleep patterns, I would say after a month, if those have not resumed to normal, I would seek additional support. That way, um, you know, you know that you're doing all that you can to support and effective coping. Um, and the, along with that same vein, if, if there's anything that is, we, you know, would be categorized as extremely uncharacteristic of the, um, of the person you're supporting, um, that I would, I would seek additional support for that as well, just to um, make sure there's not something else that might be contributing. Yeah. Um, let's see, make sure I hit on everything I wanted to hear. Okay. So um, I, as we're moving sort of out of um, the general response section, I did wanna include a really beefy, support section, because um, this is the thing that helps me learn the most and the thing that helps our learners um, to learn the most as well. Um, and so I, I hope I have a fair representation here of different visual supports that we can utilize. Um, and I've also written a couple social narratives. Um, the social narratives that are um, given as examples here are a little more complex in the way that they're written, um, but each of these things can be simplified. And um, as a matter of fact, the ones that are on our website are more simplified versions of some of those written social narratives. Um, and I'm happy, um, of course, to answer uh, any parent questions to you regarding utilization. But let's I'll walk through a couple of these first. Um, I won't read each of them, um, but I will give a general summary of what they are and the content that they're explaining. And this is my favorite visual support. <laughs> um, I found this drawing and I think it's really beautiful. Um, so here are two different examples. Um, one is a, a narrative that also has um, visual uh, or picture um, along with it to explain um, my special person passing away. The other one here is an example of how to teach lifespan um, or how to describe states of um, of a being, right? So they're strong, okay, um, or they're feeble, you know, kind of complex word in my opinion. I don't use feeble in my day-to-day -day language, but I would have put like weak or something, I don't know. Um, and the basics, right? So we, <laughs> we've got eating or not drinking, um, and are there, is Pearl, this kitty cat, okay now? Um, I have a QA and a here, let me see. Yeah, I would love to pull. I, so the question is, can you recommend therapy or resources for grief for nonverbal children? Um, and I will pull together some things. I will say, you know, in this field, this is an area that is not as well represented um, is uh, literature on um, healing from grief for nonverbal folks. Um, so I'll do my best to um, give out some, some good resources for that. Um, internally, you know, within the Autism Society, um, uh, a, a lot of clinicians within um, our team, you know, specialize in working with folks that are non-speaking. Um, most of the folks that I serve are non-speaking, so I love creating those sort of materials. So if I can't find anything good, I'll try to, maybe we can do another push for the website to, to get some, some more things out. Um, but anyhow. This example is an example for one who, um, for a more complex learner. So um, talking about, you know, graves and cemeteries, not only the, you know, um, cause of death, but then understanding where does the body go? So I'll, I'll have more, a greater 
discussion on where does the body go, where does the spirit go in just a moment here, and how to explain those things to your learner. But I'm going to give a couple of these examples first. Um, a more simple uh, example might be, I miss my mom. This makes me feel sad. Um, and some visual supports to on how to calm down when feeling sad. So I can close my eyes. I can take five deep breaths. Um, if you have a non-speaking learner who's um, new to you know visual you know visual supports or receptively is still um, building those skills um, or has those skills halted, it might be um, that you very very carefully watch for these things and then are prompting. It looks like you might be feeling sad. Would you like a hug? Would you like you know? And it takes a little more that attention of, um, you know, they might not seek out like a visual like this. Um, if, uh, I was gonna say, um, with, with these kinds of supports over time, you know, uh, you can begin to teach some responding with these um, picture cues, um, depending, you know, and this is, a, this is a pretty complex picture cue here um, of like counting my counting to five, but, it might be something super simple, just a reminder to go cuddle blanket or um, or something else that might be calming. Um, I mentioned before the value of the different tools and books that are around us. Um, and so one of uh, my favorite books, and this is uh, this is one that was a big source of inspiration um, for me whenever I was um, supporting the first learner that I had supported through this. Um, was this book by Catherine Faraday, Understanding Death and Illness and What They Teach About Life. Um, and as a caregiver, you know, as a um, clinical professional doing what we do, um, being able to have that guide and learn about the ways to talk about things. And uh, I mean, she breaks it down into, um, you know, how to use different visual sports and um, that sort of thing. Like it might seem strange to anybody who's not in the autism world to take a picture of a grave and show it to somebody, right? Like that's weird. But anywhere other community that you go into, you're like, well, I have a picture of a grave. Well, I'm teaching, you know, about where is this person? Um, so it, it talks very, um, very well about how to be a caregiver and support those things. Um, even if your learner can't utilize it themselves. Um, yeah, there's some great music in the Frozen 2 movie about doing the next thing after her, she thinks her sister's passed away. I put that here. But, ever, you know, whatever literature um, you can find, I mean, not whatever, <laughs> the good stuff, preferably, but if there's um, books around death and dying and effective coping, um, it can be something simple like these little picture books that I miss you or um, there are a couple autism specific resources, not as many as there should be, which is partly why I was inspired to do this presentation. Um, and most of them aren't free either. Um, there's a couple books that I found um, that are pretty good as well that have lots of visual supports with, um, you know, things from like Ford Maker and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a couple examples. Um, this is a social narrative example on expressing emotions. And you guys will get these PDFs as well so that you can then um, copy these and do, you know, if you need to use them um, and read through them fully. Um, and coming back to this, I know I mentioned this briefly earlier, but um, I think it's important to have a discussion about how do we uh, enmesh, you know, our loved ones in these uh, rituals and traditions that come after death. Uh, in a way that is um, accessible and, and not confusing, especially when it comes to some, some of the religious principles and um, things that may seem more figurative in nature, right? Even sometimes with the way that we talk about things, like, you know, sister has gone to be with God now. Like, what? Sister, God can come and get us at any time? Like, oh my gosh, I don't know about that, you know? So we have to be sort of careful and um, mindful about using... Um, concrete language to describe these things. We, we don't want to scare um, anybody, of, you know, of anybody who we love, of course. Um, and so 
Yeah, if, if there is going to be a rite or ritual um, that you'd like for your loved one to attend, I think it's very important to explain what to expect there, um, when, where, how long, who's going to be there, and what will they likely be doing. Um, what am I going to do when I'm there? Do you know where do I where do I go? Um, and this might be you know just this very simple, excuse me. Um, so the simpler version of this of like, we'll go there, you know, with a picture of the church. You'll sit with mom, picture of mom. And then, you know, if we need to take a break, here's the break card. We can say we need a break. And then we will go and we'll get in the car. And it might be as simple as that with just a quick, you know, first, then next sort of schedule. Um, or it might be more complex um, and explaining the other things. So, um, you know, I, I think with um, rites and rituals, uh, everybody's going to respond differently to um, like an open wake situation or a situation that is centered around the death of a person. Um, it can be a, a lot to handle for um, any of us and especially um, for someone who may have confusion about the hidden rules there um, and, and where they fit in. So. I would take into um, heavy consideration your loved one's choice about whether they would go, um, would like to go by asking directly if that's a choice or by um, just your intuition on whether or not um, you feel like they would um, be able to understand and benefit from the service that is being delivered for the person. Um, if you think it would help with coping, by all means, you know, I would recommend um, having the loved one join you. But if you think that it could be confusing or potentially traumatizing or err on the side of somewhere in the middle, I would recommend um, creating some you know, rituals of your own to celebrate the person. Um, this, of course, is going to vary from family to family. So I'm not going to make any recommendations that don't fit into the culture of your home, of course. Um, but just keeping those things in mind of um, we don't want any of these things to seem too scary. Um, if you do decide to, um, and if your loved one would like to go to one of these rites or rituals, I would recommend having them be present with um, somebody who's familiar with them, who can support them if they're having a hard time, um, who can walk them through their options of what do I do if I need to get out of here, you know, if I just can't take it anymore, so that there is um, somebody there to support them if it all becomes too much. Um, all right, so back to some more social narrative examples. Uh, this is one that helps, you know, kind of with the language surrounding normalizing emotion. Um, so it's okay to cry or be sad out loud. It's okay to not cry and be sad out loud. Um, when it comes to you know, rituals and rites, there are a lot of folks who are going to be there um, usually. And so preparing um, your loved one for what they might anticipate from other people might be a really, um, might be really useful in you know, making sure that um, they might know how to respond in that situation and anticipate what's coming next. Um, so I put a couple of things here and um, some folks like to self-script ahead of time, some don't. You know, so it might not be um, that this is perfect for every learner, but some might people, uh, so for example, it says some people might want to express their condolences, which means tell me how they feel. They might say things such as, I'm sorry for your loss. I can say thank you, Nod. I can remain silent, walk away. I think we might have... There we go. <laughs> okay. Hopefully it caught in the last bit, but <laughs> okay. Um, so here's another social narrative example uh, explaining how to find um, a grave within a cemetery. And a couple more here. So this is um, going back to rituals and rites. So, you know, if you're going to be, um, if religion will be part of those things and religion is part of the healing process for your family and for your loved one, then having some social narratives that explain um, you know, my mom died, her spirit went to heaven, but her body will stay on earth. In heaven, my mom is, I will see her again one day when I go to heaven. Or when my mom died, her spirit will be reincarnated, but her body will stay on earth. Uh, reincarnation, reincarnation means 
and I can see her in the many living things around me. So these are just two of the many you know, examples and iterations that there could be. Um, but uh, having that explanation um, is very important. All right, I have a couple of things going. There we go. I'm checking my Q and A real quick just to make sure. Thank you, David. Okay. All right, and so I talked a little bit before, and I'll come back to it now on routines for remembering. Um, so, with remembering. Um, you know, it may help to establish rituals of your own within your own home um, so that the person that you're serving or helping with or caregiving for um, can begin to initiate and participate in ways to, to remember um, and to honor the person who they've lost. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. You can create, you know, memory boxes. Actually, I have a visual for this. Go to that one. Um, <laughs> you do a memory box. Um, we'll hit on all the senses, right? So cook the meal that reminds you of grandma. Smell dad's old perfume. Um, you know, I have a, a, one of my colleagues, actually, he, this is just a quick anecdote. He messaged me and he's like, hey, I know you're doing this deep dive on, um, you know, some of the stuff regarding mourning and loss and that kind of thing. And he asked me about one of his guys and he said, yeah, I used to go on motorcycle rides with his dad. And um, you know, he really seems to miss and they used to listen to hard rock. And I was like, oh, well, can you get like his favorite albums, you know, get the speakers on the headphone, your headphones, and then put a, just a fan in his room so that he can feel the wind on his face and listen to his rock and roll tunes and remember his dad. And, uh, we, we just, we kind of nerded out to it and the guy, you know, we, he, he reported back and he's like, oh man. That was the best idea. That's all he wants to do now. <laughs> I'm like, well, we managed to simulate a, mo a motorcycle ride. Um, but, you know, these things are important. They jog our positive memories and they help us to, to honor those that we, we've lost and enjoyed these times with. So um, it's, you know, important to mesh these things um, into our, our daily lives, but especially during those times when um, that person's more likely to miss their loved one. I mean, going ahead and planning to make that special pie when it comes to Thanksgiving time and have a picture of, you know, um, grandma, you know, often like, you know, a, a spare bedroom or something like that so that they can visit with her um, if, they, if they feel like they need that for the day or have memory boxes that are full of pictures and um, you know, Wanda and I were talking about this and she said, you know what I've always wanted to do? I've always wanted to do a video. And we were talking about, you know, doing, you know, fun videos of like her playing with her son and singing their favorite songs. Um, so, you know, whatever ways we can remember um, creating rituals of our own um, so that we always have access to those things to calm us and calm our hearts a bit. So here's the supporting visual, um, kind of reiterating what I just talked about. But when I miss my mom, I can look pictures, look at pictures of her. I can listen to music that she liked. I can go to places she enjoyed. I can do the things we used to do together. I can make a meal or ask for a meal that she used to prepare for me. I can smell her old perfume or hold a piece of her clothing um, close. And so, yeah. Um, I also want to talk about. Um, some other ways to, to use tools too. Um, I'm thinking about uh, the question that came up earlier in supporting um, non-speaking individuals as well. And I have um, a learner who, he lost his dad a few years ago and we ended up making him um, a now and then board. So now I live with my grandmother and I live in a new house. Then I used to to live with my dad this is what our house looked like and we used to love to swim together so there's all these pictures of then and now and um he'll go to those things and kind of just uh, you know admire then every now and then and it, it's it signals to um his grandmother that you know he's really thinking about his dad today that means that maybe we can do some of these other things to honor him um so I have, you know, having 
tools like that. And it might not be these weird board maker cartoons like the, like our world loves. It, I so that uh, our very concrete learners and learners who have, might have a little less receptive language can utilize those things um, and communicate with us through them. All right, here's another social narrative example, um, just about what to do on how to pivot from talking about a, a source subject. Um, another one about, you know, it's okay to talk about things, it's okay to not. And that actually comes to the end of my conversation on, um, on supporting folks through these, these topics when it comes to uh, learning about death and dying and supporting somebody through loss. Um, so I, I'll open the Q&A back up. Um, and I'd love to, we can go ahead and I'll, I'll put the presentation down so we can see each other's faces. And um, that way, um, Jolana and Wanda can join me to answer questions because they know so much. <laughs> Thank you guys. I hope I'm um, a, a good range of uh, support for folks. That's my biggest, I, I told that one earlier too. I said, there's just not a lot out there and I hope I can hit in it, uh, on it. And yeah, I think you hit it um, very, very well. I even, looking through this presentation, I began to ask myself some questions because Caden's nonverbal. Um, and so I'm like, how would I present certain things to him? And Caden has a skill set where Caden fools a lot of us. He knows more than what he presents. And so for a long time, I wouldn't explain things or go in detail. Well, now I'm like, he, he understands what I'm saying if we use visuals and social stories and stuff like that. So I just kind of was asking myself, you know, what would I do um, in terms of supporting him? And I think using the picture books, um, even ex having that conversation about death and more so not focusing on, is he understanding what I'm saying? And just being consistent in offering those pictures and explaining what's going on. Um, so I really thought that was really good feedback and I loved all the examples that you gave. Um, it was really good. Thank you, Jelana. Yeah, I think you bring up the good point of, even if you're not getting that like immediate feedback from your learner, um, still doing it and still providing that education like at a level that you know they have some strengths in and um, yeah. Thanks. Another thing that stood out too because I was thinking about Kaden when you were saying you know a lot of times when we go through these situations children on the spectrum they may have the or exhibit the opposite behavior of what is going on you know so I was thinking about when you said um, you know if you if Kaden was to walk in a room and see all of his family and we we're at a funeral he would get all excited and laugh and jump up and down because all of his family is in one setting, you know, where if, you know, it was another child, like maybe on a higher scale, they may know that, okay, all my family's here to wish, you know, this loved one goodbye. You know, it just depends on where the child is. Um, another thing that I'm thinking about too is, I was thinking about the five stages of grief and a lot of what you gave in the examples, it goes along with that. So the five stages are um, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So I asked myself, for someone like Caden, who's nonverbal, we may not see that denial stage, right? Um, but for someone who's maybe higher function, they may be in denial by requesting the loved one or asking where they are. And so a way to kind of implement some of the things that you talked about is if they're in that denial phase, you can ask the child if they're speaking, you know, um, tell me about your favorite time with that loved one. And then that's a perfect opportunity to go in with the, the social stories or if they put an album together or like the example you gave about the child in the motorcycle, like that's where all those things come in. And if a child is exhibiting anger um, that may look different. Like for someone like Hayden, he may be very explosive. He may be tearing up things, you know? Um, and then bargaining, like, especially for a child that may be higher function, they may say something like, well, can my cat go instead of my loved one? Or why can't, why, well, why didn't God take me instead of my loved one? You know, so just really focusing on those stages can also help you assess where your child is, you know? And if they're asking for for their loved one more than typical like you gave that example of that grandmother she was able to even if they are nonverbal oh he's thinking about his loved one more he's thinking about his dad more today you know 
Um, so this really had me thinking because Caden is such a unique um, case as well. And I really loved all the examples and stuff um, that you gave. And I also agree that there's not a lot of, it's not represented as well in terms of resources and being able to quickly go to a therapist or someone that can interact or engage with someone that's nonverbal. And that can be so frustrating for parents. And I hope that, um, you know, as time goes on, the community can be more um, forward about those things because it is difficult to find that interview or find that person that can relate to that child. Um, but I've learned so much, so much. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. I want to I want to make sure people know too, we still have Wanda as part of this talk. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. I um, have this in you know, brief, brief break for Q&A. Um, yeah, Delana, I love everything you said. Even bringing in the five stages of grief. So, so. Yeah, I wish I was telling Leah earlier today too. I wished I'd had so many of these resources. My son lost his uh, grandfather, my dad, when he was eight. So that's been a long. Wow. Mm -hmm. And there was just nothing back then. And we just mm -hmm. think, but I think Joanna, what you said was so true. I mean, we just, even though he, we knew we couldn't understand a lot, we still just try to keep it simple, showing pictures you know, very simple talk about his granddad. And mm -hmm. I can say at 29, I think he still remembers him today. And he just knows, you know, he's accepted that he's no longer here, but you know, he's got those remembrances. And I just, but I do wish I'd had so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's so important. And it's hard too, because we can't see, especially for the kids are, who are nonverbal, we can't see how they connect the dots. You know, it would be easier if we knew how they connect the dots, then we can just give it to them the way that they need it, right? So right. just doing it consistently and encouraging those loved ones that are supporting that child to still do it, even if it looks like they may not understand or grasp the, the concept, they'll, they'll get it eventually. Right. Um, they'll connect the dots in their own way. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Well, it doesn't look like we have any um, questions coming in. So Wanda, okay, hey, sure. Let me see if I can share my screen now. Um, let's see here. I think I can get it up here. Sorry, guys, I'm not this tech savvy. Am I sharing my screen? Does it look like? Okay, y'all are seeing it, but not in the... Um, presentation mode yet. So let me see if I can get that going. There we go. Is that good? All good. Okay. Thank you, David. All right. Um, I just want to put a little disclaimer on this last portion of our webinar. And again, just thank Leah for the wonderful tools. I wish we had had so much of this, like I said, when my son was younger. Um, and there's just so not so much available. There is more available, I will say, on the topic that I'm kind of going to touch on a little bit and just doing some future planning. Um, but I do have to put a little disclaimer on this last portion. I'm coming to you mostly as, as a parent um, based on my personal experiences of raising my, you know, now adult child with autism and the unique challenges of planning for his future. Um, I cannot bring any type of legal professionalism. I'm going to be talking to you about some things that you know, there are people who know a lot more, such as attorneys and special needs planners um, that know a lot more than I do, but I am just sharing some lived experience and some possible suggestions, um, which will hopefully be helpful to you. Um, and just, you know, some things that I've learned through working with other families and what we've all kind of been going through together and planning for our children's future. Um, and I also like to just share that, um, I hope you'll see this as a safe place and a guilt-free zone because sometimes when we start talking about, you know, future planning, we're all at different places. And, um, you know, I just applaud each of you for being here. This is such a hard topic, as Leah said earlier. And I just hope you're going to be kind to yourselves in this process, whether you're just starting to think about planning with a younger child or whether you're, you know, older yourself and you have an adult child and you're thinking that you need to put some practical considerations in place. So, um, be kind to ourselves in the journey. Um, and the first thing I'll just say, most typical families, if, if there is such a thing as a typical family, but we would, you know, families with maybe, you know, a child that doesn't have a disability like autism um, would raise their child or they would expect to raise their child to adulthood and expect that child then to live independently or semi-independently for the most part. And my guess is that most of us who are parents on this webinar probably don't see that scenario as our reality. 
So our preparation for the future may need to be especially diligent. Um, just as we're told that our children with autism are all very unique, um, planning for their future is gonna look different for each one of us. Um, there's no one size fits all process. But in my experiences, I have seen some definite advantages to planning ahead as much as we can. Um, preparing for the future helps to provide assurance and Leah's talked a lot about using visuals and those kinds of things to help provide assurance and convey the idea that I will always have that support system when I need help. May not be mom and dad, but I'll have other family members or friends. Um, it helps to provide consistency that life may change, but some things will stay the same. Um, and I think most importantly, it helps to convey hope that things may be rough today, but tomorrow will be a better day. Um, so before we talk about some practical considerations, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, um, I just want to look at some of the benefits and barriers of planning ahead. If I had you all in the room with me right now and I ask you the question, what's the biggest concern for your child with autism? If you just had to name one thing, and I know that might be hard to narrow it down, but I might say, what's that one thing that keeps you awake at night? And I have no doubt that if you're like me, some of you at least, or maybe even most of you might respond, what's going to happen to my child when I'm no longer here? because I know most of us see ourselves as the biggest cheerleaders and advocates for our children, especially if they are more impacted and, and they are nonverbal or they're not um, you know, functioning at a higher level. Um, so if your experiences have been similar to mine, you also also been told many times probably to take one day at a time, don't get too far ahead. I know I've been given that advice early on with my son and I've also given that advice to other families. And it is true that, you know, we do have to take one day at a time as parents, as we're navigating and advocating, especially when our kids are young. Um, it's hard sometimes not to just live in that day. But there is also something to be said for trying to plan ahead as much as we can. Another piece of advice that, you know, I've been given and I've also probably given out some um, is take care of yourself first. You know, when you get on that airplane, you put your oxygen mask on first. Um, I know that's something the autism resource specialists tell families in a lot of our trainings. You take care of yourself first, so you'll be there for your child. And it seems kind of counterintuitive sometimes for me then to turn around and say, hey, you need to think about the future. You need to plan ahead. Um, that can be hard when you're trying to live in the day. But I just want to prop um, propose to you that for me, um, as, I've, as my child has gotten older and I started to plan ahead and looked at his future, that's actually kind of been a form of self-care for me because it's given me a lot of, um, you know, reassurance and peace of mind by, you know, just ensuring that there's provisions in place that have been planned by, you know, his family who know and love him the most. And especially during the last two years when things have been crazy, we've all been locked down and we've started to think about, you know, are we going to be here tomorrow or next month? And that's a hard thing to wrap our heads around sometimes. But just knowing that I'm doing what I can while I'm here to make sure that his future is, you know, as successful as possible. Um, and then, too, it just ensures, I think, that the siblings, if there are some, or any other key family members or players of support are educated regarding, you know, the individual's eventual needs and are not left to just get prepared and make tough decisions during difficult times. I know I've had some difficult phone calls from families who were very surprised, you know, um, maybe the siblings were living across the country and a parent died and they didn't realize how much support they were really going to have to offer their loved one. Um, and so, if we can do some of that work ahead for them, that's truly a gift. Um, and then finally, it just ensures that the well-being of your loved one will stay secure. Um, Leah's talked a lot about that, you know, those typical routines and lifestyles will be interrupted as little as possible. And now for a few of the barriers, because I know this, again, is a hard topic sometimes if we, if we haven't gotten started yet. I remember the you know, the first times I started to think about future planning and thinking, okay, we need to, you know, make some practical considerations. And some of the things that kind of got in the way, of course, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, just dealing with the present is hard enough. 
And it's often hard to see what the future is going to hold, especially when your child is young. Um, you know, Jelana's got a little one. And sometimes we, we just don't know, you know, what the future is going to hold 15 years from now. Um, and even if we can see ahead to a degree, sometimes we're just, we're just fearful, you know, so, or we get overwhelmed, we're caught up in the day, so we don't do anything. Sometimes it's just easier that way. And if that's where you are right now, like, remember, this is the guilt-free zone. We just, you know, we're going to start where we are and that's okay, wherever we are. Um, the other thing that's hard sometimes, and I hear people say, you know, well, why do I need to make a plan now when my child is younger? Things are going to change anyway. You know, I don't have all the answers and that's fine. We will not have all the answers. And probably for, for most of us, this process, even if we put in some plans for our, our our child's future, it's going to change or things can change. We don't, we don't have that little crystal ball to know who's going to be here. The people that we even have put in charge, you know, we, or we think, or we were putting in charge of our child's future are going to even be here. Um, so just remember too, it's important to address your own personal needs first. I mentioned that earlier, that self-care. Um, and the third thing that um, I think can be a barrier sometimes is just talking with family members about difficult topics like this. Um, and some families, you know, are more, you know, able to talk than others. But I just think, especially um, when I've been thinking about this topic during the last couple of years when we were locked down, I'm like, gosh, we're, we're communicating more than ever, but so much of our interaction is not face-to-face. -face. So I really, you know, I, I, I suggest that if you can, you know, try to talk with your family members face to face about some of these topics, anything you can talk about ahead of time, it's helpful. It's hard, but it's helpful. Um, but at the very least, if you can't talk, sit down and start writing, you know, write a letter, um, you know, write, at least write down their plans, even if you're not able to share them up front yet, you know, that time may come. Um, and one tip that I've, I've found really helpful over the years is just finding those families in similar situations and gaining support. Um, this is just really a bonus. I think it's also a, um, a tip to get involved with your local chapter or your parent support groups because that's where you're gonna find those families that have children you know, your age and in similar situations. And what I've found over the years is a lot of times families just build a network for their child's future. Um, I know just you know, from my involvement early on with the chapter, when my son was very, very young, I've made so many different friends, not only in this area, but across the state. And I feel like um, we have one other child, um, an adult daughter who would probably be the guardian for, for our son. And I just know that there will be a lot of people that could give her support and suggestions in the process. And that makes me feel really good. It gives me a lot of extra support. So another little tip on that. So where do we start? And we've talked about benefits and barriers. And Leah's given us so many great tools that we can use every day. Um, but then we just want to, you know, start coming up with a plan. And that's actually one of those things. It sounds really simple, but it's not always that easy. It seems like, you know, but, but I would like to propose that there are basically three steps. Um, you know, the, and the first one is we're just going to make a vision. We're going to have an, uh, a vision plan. Um, and, you know, the caregivers or parents um, can lay out that roadmap for the future because we know our loved one best. And, you know, that's that kind of the whole point of starting now while we can. Um, but I do want to bring up the point that everyone deserves self-determination. Um, and so including your loved one in planning whenever and wherever you can. Um, when we sat down and started to think about my son's future, um, he, he really you know, it was pretty severely impacted by his autism. He couldn't give us a lot of, of, of detail on what he really particularly wanted for his future. And some of you might be in that same boat, but we, we know him pretty well. And we think that, you know, we tried to really put ourselves in his mindset um, and tried to kind of have that self-determination for him. Um, and finally, um, we just really, Really need to record that vision on paper so it can be documented, it can be preserved. Um, as I think I said earlier, this is a gift not only to your loved one, but you know, to your, you know, your any other, you know, siblings of that loved one, the family members who are going to be involved in their life after you may not be there. Um, so that's important. So future planning doesn't really stop after we come up with the vision. Our um, next step, we're going to communicate. 
And again, I said that's sometimes some of the barriers um, if you have a hard time with that. Um, but one of the things I will say, um, some personal experience of working with some families, don't make assumptions because sometimes um, family members don't, if they don't realize that they're supposed to be involved or, or, or assume to be involved, um, you know, they may be way out of place across the country when something happens and not able to be involved like the parent had hoped or thought. Um, so before and during that planning process, you know, again, have those tough conversations where you can. Um, and then I think the, the, the neat thing too about having them up front is that that gives them a chance to share any reservations or concerns that they have, you know, about their vision and their part in how they think they can support um, your loved one. And I know it's been um, kind of neat for, for us to have my daughter's perspective because she's in a younger generation and just, you know, to hear some of the things that she thinks are important for her brother. Um, and that gives me a whole lot of peace of mind just to know that she's thinking about it, she's prepared, and that, you know, we're all kind of in this together to make his future the best it can be. Um, but as I said earlier, things are likely to change. So um, be prepared to edit and revise your plans through the years. Um, but also just to say that um, planning is kind of a two-star, uh, two, two uh, phase uh, planning, really. You're starting with where your loved one is today when you're starting to do the bit envisioning and then you're projecting ideas for the future. Um, and I'll be talking in a minute about some specific tools you can use, but it's really two part. You know, you're starting where they are today Kind of what I call the letter to the stranger. You know, somebody who doesn't know your child, what would they need to know about what's important in their life? And then to what you see as important for the future. Um, but definitely having those plan B support people and scenarios in place because we don't, we don't, you know, know what's going to happen, um, you know, for tomorrow. So just having some alternatives. And then of course, Lee has already given us so many wonderful tools on, um, you know, preparing our loved one for the loss, you know, as we go day to day, whatever we can teach, you know, about life and death and the cycles and, and then coming up with those memory boxes and videos. And I told her she's really inspired me because I, I would like to make a video, you know, for my son, we love to listen to music together. So I'm thinking that would be a really cool thing to do. I haven't done that yet, but I will. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, finally, um, you know, um, we're getting down to some practical things. And um, I will say there are so many tools on our website, which would be helpful to you in this process. And the, and the great thing about my kind of portion is so much of this has already been touched on on our website. So I'm gonna kind of give you a roadmap and some places to go. Um, but I do wanna mention a couple of things. One of the best tools to help start in envisioning and documenting a plan is something called a letter of intent. And a letter of intent, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a non-legal document. And basically you can do it yourself without assistance from a legal professional, no cost involved. Um, you know, it's basically how we're gonna document, document that vision that we have. Um, it can give details on your child's current life scenario, as well as possible ideas and provisions for the future. Um, it would include things like, daily routines, employment, social or recreational programs, hobbies or extracurricular activities, the current therapies, even likes or dislikes, just everything about your child's life as it is now and then what it might look like in the future or how you might like for things to go, um, even transportation, um, typical scenarios for vacations and holidays, which are so important. You know, Leah talked about that, how some of that is really important. Um, and then, of course, residential options. That's a very important um, thing to think about for the future. So there are lots of templates involved. You know, if you go to Google and you put in letter of intent, things will start to pop up. There's no really um, one plan uh, or template you have to use or need to use. Um, but it is a document that you want to make several copies of and keep in a safe place for future caregivers to have access to. Um, and another thing is, I think is a bonus is if, if you plan at some point to talk to a financial planner or a special needs attorney about your child's future, it's a great document to already have done 
when you go in, because it's not a legal document. You can just take a plan. And they already know a lot about your loved one and your family if you have that done when you go in for a consultation. You may even save yourself some time and, and money. Um, one other thing I will say that I want to call your attention to about the letter of intent is that one of our partner agencies, First in Families of North Carolina, has a great um, clinic called the Letter of Intent Clinic. So if you, you know, want, you know, you don't want to do it yourself and you want somebody to actually walk you through that process, that's a free work workshop that you can sign up for. And you will be getting the handouts and the link for that is in that handout at the end of the, under the resources. So um, important to remember. Um, so also when we're doing future planning, it's important to remember that our loved ones deserve the most least restrictive supports. We talked about that self-determination earlier um, and a couple of key points. And again, there's so much on our website on guardianship and those types of alternatives, but I'm just gonna I'm just gonna leave you with a couple of key points here on that. Um, a key point is that the child is considered legally um, an adult at age 18. That's called the age of majority. So your child may need the protection of guardianship, limited guardianship, power of attorney, or supported decision making in order to protect their interests or to manage their financial assets. Um, guardianship should never be automatic, and not all of our individuals with autism would require that type of protection. And certainly, lesser, restrict, uh, lesser restrictive alternatives are definitely preferred for those who might function um, more independently or semi-independently. And again, please refer to our resources at the end of the webinar. We'll reach out to your autism resource specialist in your region for help in this regard um, as your child gets toward that age of majority. Um, but it's just something you can be thinking about as they get into those teen years. And you actually, if your child is a, a child that would need guardianship, you can start that process at age 17 and a half. So you have a half year to think about it and to get that in process. Um, one of the things I do want to say too, some of you might have guessed and you might have thought, hmm, she didn't mention financial hardship as a barrier to this planning. Um, and that's because there is is some good, good news here that financial planning can occur even if you have not, or you don't feel like you have a lot of extra financial resources to spare at any given point. Um, there are government benefits such as um, supple, supplemental security income and innovations waiver services, government benefits that may help as a supplement to our children, both, you know, as their child, but especially after they're um, in adulthood. Um, life insurance, property, retirement funds, other types of savings accounts can help you fund a plan for your child's future when you're no longer here. And you do not have to have that up front, but rather those would be, um, you know, put into a, a special needs trust or whatever, or a plan for um, after your death. So um, a lot of times people will come to us and say, you know, I really don't feel like I have the cash right now to put things away for my child's future. Um, and like I said, there are resources available that you do not need to do that. Um, one of the things that I will say, there may be some need for upfront funds if you do plan to see a specialties attorney or set up a trust. But even then, don't let that be a barrier to you. Um, reach out to your autism resource specialist we do have lists of um, legal resources in most areas of the state where if there was a financial burden on you to, you know, pay an attorney fee, there are some resources for um, legal services at a lower co cost or pro bono. Um, so I just wanted to mention that um, to anyone who's feeling like, you know, that that would be a barrier. Um, we also mentioned already about the government benefits, SSI, um, the Innovations Services Waiver. Um, there's lots of information on our website, so I'm not going to talk too much. But just in closing with our financial tools, um, I want to talk just briefly about a few of them. I think we've got about 10 minutes, so then I'm going to try to do this kind of quickly because I still want you all to be able to have a few questions. Um, but what are the other tools? I just want to say a will for those of us who have a child with autism or disability might need to look a little different than um, for a typical family. If our child especially is um, dependent on any kind of government benefits or services, we're going to need to make sure that our wills or trusts are set up for them 
so that they don't have large amounts of money left in their name. So instead of being in their name, it would be in, in the, the trust of their name or that you're calling them as a beneficiary. Um, typically, typically, the magic number for government benefits is currently no more than $2,000 in their name. So in addition to typical savings accounts or life insurance policy, there is something fairly new called an ABLE account. Um, it stands for a better life experience. I could talk to you about that for about an hour. It's a fairly new tool. Um, it was brought about by law and I believe signed into um, law um, by President Obama in 2015 or 2014, I believe. And um, we do have them in North Carolina. Um, more states across the country are starting to have this ABLE account. And what it is basically in a nutshell, it's a 520, it's like a 529 tax advantage savings account that allows um, individuals with autism or other disabilities to have the opportunity to save money without jeopardizing their eligibility for services and support. Um, currently about up to about $15,000 per year can be saved um, or a lifetime cap of around $100,000 can be accrued. Um, and one of the benefits of the ABLE account is that the money can be used for qualified disability expenses even right now. So it's, it's not something that has to be um, used by your loved one after you know, you're no longer here, but it can be actually used now um, by individuals who qualify. Um, and again, we have much information. We have a webinar that's entirely devoted to ABLE accounts. So if that's new for you and it's something that you want, you know, might want to think about, please do um, see the resources at the end or reach out to your autism resource specialist. And finally, the one thing that I want to mention before we have some more questions, um, a special needs trust is a tool um, similar to an ABLE account, yet a little more complex. Um, in fact, maybe a lot more complex in that these types of trusts can allow families to leave an inheritance to their child with a disability, again, without jeopardizing their eligibility for government benefits. But a, a lot of times the trust is something that is funded to go into, um, you know, into to, um, being after your death. So um, they are complex and you probably would need an attorney to, in fact, I think you would definitely need an attorney to set one of these up. Um, so just, you know, just an option for you. Okay. This is my last slide before we'll take some questions. Um, for more detailed information, especially, I know I just packed a lot there in those last few tools there, but if you need more information on ABLE or um, the Special Needs Trust or Guardianship or any of those things, the SSI, um, we have lots of information and the links can be found under end of life planning resources at the end of the PowerPoint that you'll get a copy of. And you'll also see a picture here on the screen of a webinar that's called Practical Considerations. It's in our webinar library um, and goes into those um, terms in great detail if you need more information. We also have some blog posts. Um, Leah mentioned her blog post on um, death and loss. And I also had a two-part blog on, you know, future planning and the need and why we, you know, need to do that. So um, absolutely take advantage of those and I think we'll have a few minutes for questions, David, if, um, if there are some questions coming, let me see. Uh, it looks like we did have somebody that just posted a question in the chat. Can you give me uh, advice if parents are living in two different countries with different laws? How do you plan for those scenarios? Maybe that's yes. something that um, might be uh, a separate appointment. Wanda, what do you think? Yeah, maybe so. Because that's that's one of those things that we you know um, might require legal some illegal advice. That's a good question, though. Um, but yeah, we could definitely, you know, if that person, we can connect them with their autism resource specialist that, you know, can kind of problem solve with them a little bit. Or I'm happy to take an email as well. Um, our emails, I'm su sure, are on the... Or, or are they not, David? Are they available? Um, I am working on typing those in right okay. now. Put those Thank in you. Side. Yeah, I'm happy to, you know, work with you on that and try to find the answer. I may not have all the answers for that, but we'll definitely try to help you connect with someone who can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, everyone. It looks like uh, that covers all the questions that we had in the chat, um, as well as comments. 
So if you do have follow-up questions, please feel free to email any of our panelists. Uh, you can also just fill out a contact us form on our website, which is uh, www.autismsociety-nc.org. Click on the contact us button and uh, you can type in your question um, and we will have somebody uh, follow up with you via phone or email uh, as quickly as possible. So uh, Wanda, uh, Leah, and Jelana, thank you so much for all of the information. A wonderful job. And uh, for the rest of you that tuned in tonight and had questions and um, hopefully learned some stuff, thank you for joining us. We do have other webinars that we offer uh, on a monthly basis. Please feel free to visit the website and click on our calendar events and or our upcoming workshops page. And you can sign up for additional. There we go. Now it's working. Of course. Sorry about that. Now it starts moving. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, check the calendar events and or upcoming workshops page to be able to sign up for another um, uh, workshop. And uh, most of these are offered both in English and Spanish. So please share that information with uh, other parents and other folks that you know in your community. And we will hopefully be able to uh, see your name and or chat with you at a future event. Thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Take care of yourselves and uh, look forward to supporting you in any way you need in the future. Good night.